Good evening and welcome to Cancer Grace. My name is Jared Weiss and I'm a medical oncologist at the University of North Carolina Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm also a faculty member here at Grace and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about induction chemotherapy for head and neck cancer. Let's start by clarifying what is induction chemotherapy. Standard therapy to cure head and neck cancer consists of either surgery or radiation with the addition of chemotherapy for more advanced patients, with the chemotherapy given at the same time as the radiation. After surgery, low-risk patients may be observed, while higher-risk patients require radiation after surgery or even chemotherapy and radiation at the same time. This is adjuvant therapy or additional therapy done to improve the rate of cure. Similarly, many patients who get radiation or chemotherapy will later need surgery, either right away for an incomplete response or later for a local relapse. If adjuvant therapy is something that you can do after your main curative therapy, then neoadjuvant is something that you can do before your main therapy to improve your rate of cure. And in this case, we're talking about chemotherapy. For reasons completely unclear to me, when you give chemotherapy upfront in head and neck cancer, you call it induction. So we're talking about giving chemo before surgery or chemo before radiation or chemo radiation. That's our topic today. Here's the brief outline of what we're going to talk about today. We're gonna to start with brief historic data on induction. We're gonna move on to a regimen called TPF that I credit with bringing induction chemotherapy back to the forefront of conversation. We're gonna move on to a weekly regimen that is in my opinion more promising. And we're gonna conclude with my opinions on the future of induction focused on three studies that I'm particularly excited about. So let's take a quick trip down memory lane. This is Mach NC, one of the most famous studies in all of oncology. It's actually a meta-analysis or a combination of other studies. And the question that this meta-analysis was trying to answer was whether chemotherapy could improve treatment outcomes in head and neck cancer. And so they pooled together studies that gave chemotherapy with radiation at the same time, concomitant therapy, studies that gave chemo followed by radiation or induction, and finally, adjuvant, studies that gave chemotherapy after the radiation. And so focusing on these top two groups, you can see that the induction chemotherapy did seem to improve outcomes, but the concomitant therapy did so more. And this was one of the studies that led to our standard of care of giving chemotherapy and radiation at the same time for the primary cure of head and neck cancer. Of note, however, and an important note, is that the concomitant chemo used in more of these studies was more modern theme chemo than that used in the induction context. So it's possible that concurrent therapy was better because that's a better paradigm, but it's also possible that it related to the drugs used. TPF is a three drug regimen. The T is docetaxel, P is cisplatin, and five is 5-FU. For a while before the two studies that I'm going to show you, the last two drugs, PF or cisplatin 5-FU, were a standard induction regimen when induction was used. These studies randomized patients to that standard regimen of cisplatin and 5-FU, or a third drug, the addition of docetaxel. One study was done in Europe, the other was done in the US. There were some design differences in them, but fundamentally, they studied a very similar question. Here's the data from the second of these, TAX324. You can see that the three drug induction regimen had better survival and better progression-free survival than the two drug regimen. There are a number of caveats here. First, and most importantly, neither of these compared to a standard of care or standard chemo radiotherapy. All they showed was that three drug induction is better than two drug induction. However, many in my field extrapolated and said if three drugs can be so much better than two, then surely induction may have some merit. There are more problems, however. Here's the toxicity tables from these two studies. These are only the rates of severe toxicities, grade three, four toxicities, extremely high. 
Now, if this were simply a case of short-term pain leading to long-term gain, many patients would accept this. Many patients for the six or nine weeks of induction would happily suffer through even extraordinary toxicity if it let them be cured for life. However, that's not quite what happened here. Actually, the short-term pain led to a lack of long-term feasibility. Almost a quarter of patients in the control arm and 21% of patients in the three-drug arm could not be treated with the protocol-defined subsequent therapy. It was too intense for them. You might be scratching your head as to why three drugs could be less toxic than two. It's because the 5-FU dose was lower in the experimental arm. You might ask, well, what did they get if they didn't get the study-defined therapy? Well, 7% in the three-drug arm and 11% in the two-drug arm actually got no attempt at cure at all. Very recently, results were published of a study that randomized oral cancer patients to surgery alone or surgery preceded by TPF induction therapy. You can see that survival was similar. It was not improved. At ASCO this year, we saw the results of two studies that looked at TPF induction chemo before chemo rads. In terms of design of this first study, the chemo rads regimen, while it's been properly field tested, is not one commonly used in the US or in the world. It uses drugs that are less common as well as a radiation schedule that is less common. The induction was only two cycles, and actually the study was halted early due to inability to accrue all of the planned subjects. While it was supposed to have 400 subjects, it only got 280, and so it was insufficiently powered from a statistical standpoint. You've already heard my criticisms of the regimen that is insufficiently active and excessively toxic. Here are the treatment results. You can see that survival and disease-free survival were not statistically improved. Response rate was 73%. Interestingly, there were decreased cancer deaths in this study, but increased non-cancer deaths, suggesting that maybe the regimen did something for the cancer, but that that was balanced by the harm that the toxicity of the drugs otherwise did. And there were hints of benefit for the most advanced patients. The other study gave three cycles of induction, Again, chemoradiotherapy that, while reasonable, is not standard of care, or at least commonly used outside the context of induction. Again, treatment outcomes were not improved. Again, the study under accrued, it didn't get all of the planned patients. So in my opinion, TPF is not optimal chemotherapy. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our GraceCast, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info. And that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support.